Have you ever wondered, can you ask for what you want and get it? That's what we'll talk about today. He who has learned to disagree without being disagreeable has discovered the most valuable secret of a diplomat. Robert Easterbrook. Today we're going to talk about negotiations and in a little bit different way than we did in episode 27, where we also talked about negotiation. We're going to use the book, Ask For It, How Women Can Use the Power of Negotiation to Get What They Really Want by Linda Babcock and Sarah Lashever. This book is a how-to manual on how to negotiate. This is good for anyone, not just women, but how to ask for what you really want in life. Their other book is called Women Don't Ask, Negotiations and the Gender Divide. That's more of a scientific book. They also speak at a number of universities and other places talking about this particular issue. So I needed help. I needed help in negotiating for a job I was going to get. Yep, my big uncertainty in life was getting a new job. Every time in the past, I got new jobs because I was desperate, because I really needed to change jobs. Something went horribly wrong with where I was working. This is the first time in my life where I've actually gone out gotten a new job just for the sheer purpose of making my life better. But in order to take this job, it was going to have to pay the bills, and I needed to know how to negotiate. This job is going to help me in ways that I couldn't have achieved back in my other job. Very excited for it. But I was worried. I did need to negotiate. And Allison, my friend at podfeet.com, suggested these two women and the first book that they wrote along with the Ask For It book, which I found out later, was a manual. I probably read it eight times, particularly chapter two, since I realized I needed help negotiating. I will say this, that when you have a podcast that is meant to help other people improve their lives, it proves your own life too. It really pushed me to go for this job and try for it. I don't know if I had this podcast if I would have felt so equipped empowered to do this step. And this negotiation step will take it a step further for any of you who need something from whatever situation you're in, whether it's with a spouse or a job, whether it's a new job or whether it's just something you need in the job you currently have. So the main point about this book is the fact that women just don't even ask for raises. They don't negotiate their salaries. They just accept whatever it is they're given. I know that was true for me. When I took this job that I currently have, I had this weird idea that this job was worth something. Just like if I believe when you go buy a car and you look at the sticker, you say, oh, this car costs this amount of money. Hmm, okay. Never struck me that you had to negotiate for these things. And how do you negotiate for these things? I had no idea. Later on, I found out in other jobs that people had negotiated for salaries. And one person who had less credentials than I had, he got a bunch more money than I was getting from the same job, and someone else had asked for more vacation. So it was my own thing. How could you be mad when you didn't even try? You didn't even try to ask for it. And I guess in the end, that's just the way the world is. If you don't ask for it, you're not going to get it. They give this really important example of two people. The guy asks for $5,000 extra and gets it. They both start out on the same day. He took that $5,000 and invested it and the raises he got from above the $5,000. He would have had over a million dollars by the time he retired. So this is a big issue. Because not only are women just getting paid less, which was money they probably could have used, they're losing money when it comes down to the long term. Because now his salary is $5,000 more, his raises will be more, his ability to do everything will be more. And because she never asked, she didn't get it. It's weird because when they surveyed people, women in the companies, when they got new jobs, didn't really feel bad. They thought, oh, well, I thought the salary was pretty fair. And then they asked around and they found out that a lot of people in the same company for the same kinds of jobs did negotiate and got more. 
It wasn't the fact that women were just trying to be too nice or non-confrontational. They just didn't even think to ask. They didn't even try to ask. And they didn't know that the people around them were asking. And so this becomes a big point to them. They wanted to tell people, you need to ask. When I was thinking about this job and fretting about this situation, I wanted to take this job. But if it didn't pay enough, I wasn't going to be able to do so. I fretted about the whole situation. How am I going to play hardball? I'm not a very good person who is good at playing hardball. I could get my reasons together and do other parts of it. But when it comes to the negotiation, it certainly had me fretting. I remember a long time ago when I got out of college, I didn't know what I wanted to be. And this job happened for this um, car sales company. And it was right by my apartment. And I thought that might be kind of fun. I like cars. You know, it'd be interesting to be a car salesman for a while. And I got asked one question. One family walks in and you sell them a van and it costs $20,000. The next family walks in and they look like they don't have very much money, but you sell them a car for $20,000. But then the third family walks in and they look pretty wealthy. What do you sell the van for? And Jill says, $20,000. Believe it or not, I didn't get the job. Negotiation is a big part of things that you didn't even know were a part of life if you didn't know like I didn't know. But even when it comes down to other places in your job, are you being overlooked? Do you think that jobs pass you by without you even being offered them or talk to them about it? Are there things that annoy you? Maybe your office isn't workable. Maybe there's too much noise. Things that you could negotiate for that you're just not. Either because you don't know you can negotiate for them or because you're just afraid that it's going to mean that they'll get rid of you, they won't like you, or something like that. And even so, I tend to be one of those very friendly people. I get overlooked a lot of times. I help people. I've trained almost everyone who got promoted over me. But in the past, I've supervised 60 people. I worked on contracts. I've done a lot of things. But did I ever press anyone on anything? Did I ever negotiate what my career path was going to be? I really didn't. And just like the fact I didn't get it, I never asked for it either. Again, I sort of feel like there should be this fairness in the world, but that is just not how the world works. You have to ask for the things that you want. Even dedication and hard work gets you overlooked quite a bit. It makes me feel when I read this book that I should have been more bold earlier on. I should have demanded things more early on. The other thing comes in, too, is I think employers like to see you have a bit of moxie to you. They want to see you be that kind of person who can reach out and ask for something. Because in the end, that kind of fortitude is what probably is going to make you successful in that job, too. But this is where you can go in and start saying, I want this next promotion. What things do I have to do in order to get it? What things do I have to learn? What classes do I have to take? To get the promotion I'm looking for, start asking for those things. But because this book and the way it's framed, it also hits you up with good questions to ask. Am I in the ballpark? Is this the range of salary people in the team get? Would you say I'm on the upper end or the lower end? I saw that you offered that job to Bob without even asking if I was interested in it. Did you not think I was interested in it, or do you think I'm not qualified for it? And it might hurt a little to get some answers, but it will help you get the next job, help you get what you're looking for. And then the other problem is, is if you don't know what you want, if you don't have a plan for what you want or where you want to go, it's really hard for you to get it too. Bosses can't read minds. And if you don't know, they're not going to know either. I remember once I said I wanted to be promoted. I wanted to be this particular role. And I was asked, well, do you want a raise? Do you want a title? Or are you looking for a different job? And unfortunately, I just sat there going, uh. And it sent me back to my desk. And I just sat there for a long time going, uh, um, I didn't know. 
And if I don't know, how am I going to ask for what I want if I don't even know what I want? So I think when I read this book, it made me realize I've been missing out because I've never asked for the things that I really wanted. So the first part, too, is that you're going to have to look at what your gifts and talents are. Where's your fortitude? What makes you a valuable employee? What makes you worth investing in? And have an honest look at it. There are things about you that are amazing and some things that people don't even know about you. So you'll have to start out with an inventory of who you are, what your strengths are, and what you bring to the job you have now. What do you bring to the company? Then you have to think about, again, what you want. And then you have to think about how do my gifts and talents benefit the company and how will this promotion, this change also benefit the company around you? She gave in the book several examples of people who were really good at something. And because they were good at it, it brought new business opportunities to the company. Someone who said, I'm talented at this. I would love to start an aspect of the company that does that. And the boss was like, you are reading my mind. That is exactly where I want this company to go. And because she asked for it, she knew what she wanted. She knew what she was good at. She had a great chance of getting it. So you have to think, too, do you want a new title? I never believed much in titles. I'm like, who cares about the title? No one cares about the title. Titles are just, you know, meaningless. But in a sense, they're not. And I realized that later on because you are seen as someone who is on the go, moving up, being promoted, having important job responsibilities and duty. If you have the same job title your entire life and the same responsibilities, it looks like you're stagnant and not going anywhere. So as much as I disregarded the title, I think I should have given it more weight in my own life. She says, too, that while you're working on this negotiation and finding out details and asking questions about where you are, If for whatever reason you get what it is you're looking for, make sure that it's on paper, it's someplace that's recorded. If it's just a handshake or a promise, it may not happen. Make sure that you get it on something that it'll be remembered. And she says, too, that you have to look at timing. Sometimes if you ask for something, the boss will say, you know, this is a bad time or things are really tight right now. Then you can say, okay, I understand that. You know, it is tough times right now. What can I do in the meantime to ensure this happens when times get better? And what can I do to make sure that when the money turns around, the economy turns around, I'm the first one on that promotion list? You want to make sure that you go after the things you want, not just a promise, not just a verbal agreement, something on paper, and something that Whenever X, Y, and Z happens, maybe they say, well, we really wanted you to be a better this or a better that. You can then take whatever advice they gave you, go get it, and then hold them to their promise. So can you negotiate to get classes paid for you? Can you open up a new position within the company? This is where we talk about that you want to be able to defend what it is you're asking for. Someone says, that's a lot of money. You've done your research, you've looked into this, and now you say, well, people in this industry get paid X. I am significantly below that. Well, well, how about if we give you this amount of raise? No, I'm sorry. People are in this industry are getting paid X, and I want to be paid in line with what this job is. Then you also have to have your BATNA, which is going to be your best alternative to negative negotiation. So if you don't get what you want, what is something else that potentially you could get that would be as good? And that could mean another job, but it also could mean an office. So maybe you're out in a general area of the office and they can't give you a raise right now. Could you get an office? Could you get a new title without a raise right now? There's things that you can do in order to satisfy some of your need while still not maybe getting exactly what you want. It could just even be more time off. It's also a dangerous point if you decide to fake a job offer. So this is something I've never done, and I heard people warned about doing this. If you go into your company and you say, 
well, this other company is going to pay me twice as much money as you are. I want more money. Even if it's real, but you don't want to work at that company, if you make some kind of a fake offer or an offer that you don't want to take, but you're just doing it to try to create some competition for you, there's a good solid chance that person might say, well, honestly, we can't keep you at that. Go ahead and take the other job. So you have to be careful about these situations if you're trying to raise up a situation to make yourself seem more appealing. So whenever you're going through these negotiations, make sure you're honest, sincere, that you realize your worth, that you give them room to negotiate, and you fight for it. You actually go through the steps, you're persistent about it, and try to make sure that you're not lowballing the situation, because if you ask for a lower number, just to be nice, you're probably going to get that lower number. So you want to be, she says, a little bit ambitious about what you're asking. So there's room for you to negotiate as well. She says you certainly want to do this when your bargaining power is high. Maybe you finished a big project, you're looking very good, or you're the kind of person who is in a niche position who just knows more than everybody else. That gives you some power there. You know, she gave the situation where a lot of new people came into the company and she knew that the boss wanted someone to train them. This is your chance to try to ask for that promotion, offering that you will train these new people. You might have some leverage there. But she says, don't wait too long. If you wait too long to negotiate, you might just get so cranky that you don't even want to be in this company anymore or that you feel like you back down. Maybe you say, oh, there's no rush. I don't have to do anything. But that long wait will keep you from asking and then make you feel more disconnected from the company, more forgotten about. And so you may never even get what you want. She says at the end, you might be too mad and you can't even stay at the company anymore because you're just so mad about it. She says a good part is that you want to make sure that you anchor at a higher place. She gave the example that when you negotiate for a car, if someone comes in pretty close to the price that is listed on the car, the salesperson knows they're just going to get the list price. But if you are drastically far apart, now they think, oh, wow, I really have to work to get this price up. She says it's better to let the other person start so you can move them in the direction you want to go. She says it's best when you're not in the boss's office, you get a conference room or a cafe or something else. She says that a round table is a good way to go because everyone is equal at a round table. There's no head of the table. She says that you want to start out high, not the minimum. They will counter offer. You want to be able to offer something else and don't accept what you're given. You want to have some wiggle room. She says, never ask if this is negotiable, but proceed as if it already is. You can even pause the negotiations if you think they're not going very well and say, this is a lot to digest. Can you help me put it together about why this offer that you're giving me should matter to me or help my situation right now? And she says that it, you look open, if you ask questions, it may allow the other person to back down without looking like they lost because you gave them good reason for it. And she says that when you get towards the end, the concessions, the changes should get smaller and smaller until you get to the bigger end. She says bringing a laptop is a bad idea because it makes it look like you're looking at the screen and not the other person. You should have incredible eye contact with the other person while you're in the room. She says that if you need some live calculations, have another person in the room. I don't know... That seems like a little weird to me to have another person while you're negotiating there. Try to have all your ducks in a row so you know where you're going. And then she says practice. Practice on the small things. This was the final chapter of the book, and I really appreciated this, where it talks about one day just leave early or go to a store and ask for something you know you won't get. Ask for something free. Oh, I love this shovel. Can I just have it? They're going to say no, because obviously you can't have the shovel for free. Or you might even try something even smaller where you go into a restaurant and say, you know, I've always wanted to try the apple pie. If I ordered a meal, would you throw in the apple pie for free? Something like that. But start practicing. I loved her exercises because I was in a crunch situation with this job. I didn't get a chance to do some of these things that you're supposed to do to work your way up. But I really want to try them soon to see how they work. But she said that in the end, you know, if you ask for a printer and you don't get it, if you want a new chair, 
but you're probably not going to get it, get used to the no. First of all, it'll stop making you so freaked out when you hear no. You'll start being able to take it better. So it will make your nerves better. It'll make you more confident. But try to do some minor negotiations. Go to the gym. Negotiate a new contract. Try to negotiate, she says, even for the price of gas. Every time we hear no, we're going to become more immune to what we heard, and we're going to get better at that negotiation. We want to get comfortable. We want to get comfortable with risk. We want to get comfortable with no. And we got to figure out where our bargaining power is. These exercises go on. Ask for three things you you couldn't possibly get. Ask for one long shot thing that you would love to try. Hey, could I just work a four-hour day? You're probably going to get a no. But again, you're going to work those negotiation muscles and get better at it. And she says, never apologize. It was worth a try. So just get to that point where you're comfortable with being rejected or the long silence of, what? You want to work four days? But don't get angry. Don't get sad. Keep your logical mind there. Know what your batnas are, your next alternatives. But maybe you also have to know what the worst situation is. At what point, if you heard something, you know, sorry, Jill, you're never going to be promoted. Is that the point you leave and go look for another job? You'll have to know exactly what it is that is the most insulting thing they can say or the most negative thing they could say that would just make it so that this is no longer a job, a situation you can be in. And in the end, she says that you should feel confident that day, pray, splurge, get a good night rest. The thing I liked about it, too, is she said that if you negotiate, try to think of a prize. You know, so if you're looking for a new salary, you're looking for a job negotiation, she says, set up a prize and you tell yourself, if I negotiate for this job, I can have this thing. So I did set up a prize in my brain. It was a $200 waterfall that I could put on my deck so I could have nice gurgly water. I don't know in the end I'm going to get it, but you know what? I achieved it, and so I feel proud at least that I did. One point that I thought was kind of interesting about this is that she mentioned uh, in focus groups that there were situations where people, um, they tested people, and when women asked for more salary or asked for something on the job, and then the people in the study were asked if they would hire this person or not hire this person or which person would they hire. They did, in the end, were less likely to hire a person who was a woman who asked for something. So then they try to dig down a little bit into this. Why are people who are asking for something not getting what they want? And not only that, are more disliked by the people in the study. And what they found is it had a lot to do with likability. The person just didn't seem like that nice of a person once they asked for something. So she said the important thing is that you want to keep that likability up. Smile, nice eyes, don't cross your arms. She said don't point at people and take long pauses if you need to. Take a break from the meeting if you have to. But make sure that that likability stays up despite the fact you're asking for something, particularly when you're a woman for whatever reason. You know, and I get it to an extent. I like to be nice, and so I want to be liked. But if you keep that likability up, your negotiations will go better, even if you seem at that moment you're a little bit bossy because you're asking for something, you're still considered to be a likable person. She said then you can find the zone of agreement, which is means a good place for both people, a bargaining range that everyone walks away with something that they're looking for. A negative bargaining zone is where what both people want will not overlap and does not overlap. So in the end, I really like this book. I thought it helped me so much in this time to feel like I could negotiate for my salary. But I felt confident that I could ask for what I need. I don't know why it strikes us that asking for what you need is like a bad thing. So my challenge to you is try to negotiate for something little. Try to negotiate at a restaurant. I've always wanted to try your apple pie. What if I bought the full dinner? Could I get a free slice of apple pie with that? See how it works. Again, something just to build up your confidence in taking risks. 
All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate listening to the podcast. Please tell a friend about the podcast. I hope to grow the podcast and I hope that more people listen to it. A few things of note, I'm going to put a link in the show notes about how I changed the way that I do the show notes for this podcast. I was on another podcast talking about how I'm using AI to write things for me. As much as I'm a talker, I'm not very good at the things like show notes. And so I went through and started using AI to help me out. And that podcast can show you what you could do to use AI to make your life better, not do your work for you, but instead help you in a place where you're just not very good at it. Have a wonderful week. And remember, the art of getting what you need in life starts with small steps.